Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the Printed Circuit podcast, where we discuss trends, challenges, and opportunities across the printed circuit engineering industry. I'm your host, Steph Chavez. In this episode, we'll focus on design automation. Here are two of my dear friends and industry colleagues, Ray Macias and Gregory Beers. These two industry design gurus are simply amazing. We got a lot of history together, so I, I want to give them a big thanks uh, for being here and, and joining in. Thanks again. Awesome, Steph. Great introduction, man. I appreciate you having us. Yeah, thanks, Steph. It's good to be here. Uh, Ray Macias, been here for about 35 years through the Mentor Siemens environment here, working on Expedition Enterprise. So look forward to talking to you and discussing how folks utilize the tools and how we can be more productive. Ray, you kind of beat me a little bit, but I was going to say, why don't each of you take a turn, give us a little bit of your background and uh, what you bring to the table, you know, not just to Siemens, but to the industry. Well, you know, I just uh, gave a little spiel about myself and again, just utilizing these tools and helping customers be productive and getting the most out of it and the best practices just uh, it was a real good opportunity for me to work with customers and make them successful. So I'll let you take over. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. Ray is the ninja at this, but he's got me beat as far as working with Siemens. But I've got uh, 30 years as an electrical engineer. 25 of those years were specializing in military guidance and communication system design. 12 years and counting now with Siemens alongside Ray, helping our customers with all things printed circuit board related. I can attest to these guys, what they do, and it's amazing in their customer support. You know, for the longest time, I've been on the, on the receiving end of their support. As we talk through this podcast, you, you, we'll, we'll share some stories of uh, we've been in the trenches and how we've killed it together, the three of us. So guys, when we talk about what doesn't work today when it comes to design automation, what is your take on it? What are you seeing that doesn't work? So a lot of the legacy design methodologies just can't keep up with today's complexities. Uh, designs are overly complex to a point. A lot of the copy and paste things that we did in the past, those work phenomenally. But now we've gotten so that it's, it's not this case. Just copy and paste won't cut it anymore. So many things don't match up. Layers don't match up. The density doesn't match up. Everything's moving at the speed of immediately, I like to say. Everybody has a design timeline where everything needs to be done immediately. We don't have the legacy timelines that we had where we'd say, well, we'll be done in two weeks. And the manager comes back in two weeks and says, hey, I'll be done in two weeks, right? And so we got to get these things to get out of that serial step-by-step mode. I think it's harder to achieve success when doing everything manual today, at least from a, in a timely manner, especially with the increased complexity of today's products. One of the things I find is that, you know, the manual data manipulation of the past to integrate between tools is, let's face it, it can be error prone and it's time consuming. It takes a lot of resources to get things appropriate. And the communication between engineering and teams is also a huge bottleneck from the past that we just, you know, passing papers just doesn't work anymore. I couldn't agree with you guys more, especially, you know, coming from the mill arrow background, working in silos, that, that those days are gone. You're not going to be successful working in silos or having teammates working in silos. It's definitely, you've got to have a bi-directional communication in both directions and from the different domains, as well as the different disciplines, they've got to be able to integrate and, and the more instantaneous integration you have, the better you're going to be with the communication. So I can definitely see how you have to evolve and change it. The old ways, old methodologies ain't going to cut it. You know, so we know what the problems are or what they can be, but what are the solutions, you know, when we think about best practices and, and that's really what I'm here to really get down to is, you know, the best practices that PCB designers should implement. What are you guys' take on that? So overall, our goals to, for design automation, for our considerations are around, uh, simply put, as an integrated flow for product development. The more we integrate everything in our entire flow, the more power we have to get things done in a timely manner or with whatever assistance needs to come along. Taking it out of that step by step and having the people working with us lockstep with what we're doing, being able to jump in at any point. And one of those keys to the success of the flow is making sure it's repeatable and scalable. It doesn't do us any good if a design goes from a one channel radio to a 20 channel radio and we can't block on those extra pieces that we need. And so it really needs to be scalable and it needs to be able to, whether I hand it off to you, Steph, or I hand it off to Ray, being able to make that repeatable, regardless of who's at the helm, is super important. And then solid tools and a detailed process guide are major factors in delivering that we get this, as we like to call it, the digital twin working properly and using all of our automation. Ray, anything you want to throw in there? I love that digital twin stuff, but, uh, you know, best practices uh, included, you know, there's some things you, you really need to take a look at, right? And when creating these devices and these groups and these systems, being able to 
do things, as we say in the industry now, shift it left, right? Being able to push this stuff up higher in the design process to accommodate for things in the back end. So creating standards, like even you, would, you wouldn't think this makes a lot of difference, but when you're trying to replicate things and you're trying to, let's say, involve other groups with the way you can actually hand data off to different clusters of folks across not only your company, but maybe the world, Establishing naming conventions like grouping, net classes, constraint classes that drive the quality of the end of the, the results and the consistency across these designs for a higher level of productivity, right? We have these things like constraint management. That's a key level to achieving intended results. When you constrain the design from the front end and it pushes this data into the back end, it reduces the amount of actual personal interaction because it's already built into the design product information. So constraint management, I think, is a key to achieving some good end results. And then detailed using these driven constraints, pushing that router, you know, today, pushing the the engineers that are laying the card out and routing these traces, if you will, putting down the metal, but having a guide that's even unseen to them. They, and these tools are so smart that they actually know what the end result should be. When we talk about the different automation horsepower that's there, I mean, there's a lot of things that, uh, and personally, I feel that, uh, you know, years back, I was very reluctant to take advantage of that stuff or, you know, to, to try it even to attempt it because I wanted to control every little aspect. That was my mindset is that, no, I need to manually do that. Well, that manual step just took a long time. Yeah. You know, I thought it was perfect and it, it had, you know, success at the end, but look at the time it took me. And, and the more I got familiar and started to trust the tool and use it to my advantage when the opportunity was there, it made a huge difference. And I was amazed on how fast I can complete a task. It's just truly amazing, you know? Generating outputs, right? The manufacturing outputs is one of the things that we've really come a long way in automation. These outputs, like like you were talking about, it doesn't matter if we get the design right if we can't output it to the vendor. And so one of the things we've, we've done is the ability to have these, these output steps predefined so that they're already set up in a template, if you will. Any user can grab that template and generate their outputs to create these boards for the fabrication package, the assembly package. A lot of that data we can set that up before it ever gets to the layout person. And that way, all this stuff is generated by everyone equally. And the value you're going to get from that is really a shortened design cycle time, increasing your layout's efficiency and the ability to, to play with what-if scenarios. This makes a way more optimized and efficient design process. One of the things that I wanted to comment on is when we talk about design automation, you know, in the past, that meant scripting. It meant a lot of maybe getting somebody who's familiar with writing different types of connectivity between tools. One of the things that is really nice about the solutions we have today, especially within Expedition Enterprise, is it's a very integrated package. So design automation comes almost to some degree, very natural for us. It's not something that we have to belabor today where we did in the past. So the automation that we're talking about is inherent in the tools, which I really like the fact that you'll be able to have a much more consistency, not only in the manufacturing output, but just the way you walk through your PCB design process or system design process today. I mean, even going back up a little further in the process, when placing components in layout, one way to speed that process up is besides being able to place from your schematic, today we have this incredible capability of leveraging circuits that are already pre-done. They've actually been qualified, as some folks say, a golden circuit, right? And that means something that's been done before. It's already been built. It's already been vetted. It's in the field working. And now we want to leverage this across other products. So reuse circuitry is huge to say. Time And I think, Steph, you've experienced this in real life. Taking advantage of reuse. I mean, the three of us, you know, you remember a couple of years ago when my previous employer, the three of us attacked a design or a project, not just a design. It was, you know, three, three boards in that system. And we took advantage of the reuse and, and really significantly, and let's just come out and say it, we killed it in that project regarding the, the cycle time and how fast I was able to do that design or that project with the, the three boards. And what you guys uh, did for setting me up for success was amazing. Between myself and the other double E, we killed it. And what we did and, and our customer was just blown away on, on the speed and accuracy. But where it made a difference was the double E that, you know, that other double E down in the lab, 
when he fired it up, there was no guessing. You know, it was those were vetted circuits that were known to work, and there was no surprises in it. You know, one shot, one kill. There was no cuts and jumpers, so that's huge. Yeah, the great thing about that too is you're not only getting quicker time to the end of the design phase, right? But you don't have to pay for those reoccurring engineering costs. You're saving a lot of time. Yes, you're exactly right. And that's the thing is that those are reusable circuits. Those are vetted, already validated. And, and you know, in Mill Arrow, when it comes to recertification, that certification process could easily be twenty to $50,000, depending, to get products uh, certified and to have to go and recertify them because you change a circuit. So, you know, reusing that across the enterprise level is, is key. And I'm very uh, adamant or very big on reuse. And if you can take advantage and create your library structures for use, it's, it's awesome. So Gregory, tell me, you know, when you think about the goals, you know, when we think about respins, is it uh, still um, hard pressed for your customers? Are they still looking to reduce the number of respins or are they still accounting for them? Everyone knows that every time you have a respin, you're blowing a lot more money than you need to. When you get to the point where you have to respin a board, it's already costing at least 10x over what it would have if you caught it in the design phase. One of the big things we do is correct by construction and by having that known golden circuit that Ray was talking about. If I pick a circuit from Ray and I put it on my board, it's already been tested. I place it down. I can do it one to X times. I can do it as many times as I need and I can repeat that. Now, when I test that out, I run it through Valor or whatever. It's already been analyzed once. It's already been working once. The only thing I could really mess up was the globals going in and out of it. We know the circuit works, right? And so having those globals checked by our system's DRCs is amazing. It keeps us from making stupid mistakes by putting ground on an analog ground, for example, right? And, and stepping and putting those pieces in, laying them down, knowing they work, verifying them with Valor before I ever send them out, automating my outputs, and then sending it out to Fab. Of course, when I get the board back, I expect it to work. There's no other way to think. You've already proved it once. You step and repeat it on another board. You verify you have everything good. Off it goes to the races. We're not talking about copy circuit or copy paste. We're talking about literally reuse with multiple layouts that you could have a 12 layer stack or 18 layer uh, stack of a circuit that you, you've now saved in your library and you're reusing that in other designs. And the time it saves to, to migrate that or get that into your library or have to recreate it manually, I mean, you're, you, you could easily you know, spend a week laying out one, just one circuit, whereas you just grab it from a library and treat it like a 0805 part, you know, and, and place that down, rotate it, flip it, primary side, secondary side. Yeah, it's the power in today's tools is just amazing. I just think more people ought to take advantage of it. And I see that there's a lot of reluctancy to that. It just surprises me in that case, you know, when we talk about the take of the shift left, I mean, Ray, tell me, you know, when, when you think about shift left, you mentioned that, that phrase before, what is that? It basically means moving some of the back end processes that cost us in the end after and trying to account for those up front and doing whatever we can to be preventative instead of reactive. I think that's the big thing. In the past, we laid stuff down, we did things, and then the tools weren't as mature as they are today to deliver that up front. And so things that weren't accounted for got caught at the back end where it may have required that you picked up and removed a lot of the percentage of the board that you'd already laid out, which is, again, is going to cost you time and money. We've come a long way from some basic routers. You know, back in the day, routing technology threw feed-throughs in everywhere and just uh, turned your board into a piece of cheese with a lot of holes from a lot of rats. So in this case, I think today we've got, we've got some incredible technology being able to leverage your routing technology, either in a manual slash semi-automatic form, utilizing this tool, this incredible tool called Sketch Router and Sketch Planner. You can lay your card out and everybody knows that the best way to get a good route is to have a good placement, right? So even before you go to the routing, you have tools today that can optimize your pin package out, you know, the IO. You can drive a much better route based on, you know, optimizing the pins of an FPGA or swapping the gates of your devices. Now, this isn't new technology, but the technology that's new is how it gets done and how it's much more effective. And then just being able to leverage these new routing technologies that within seconds can provide a good idea of where your congestion is, how many traces you can get on one layer 
Will you need blind and buried vias? Is it through holes? Through a hole, okay. So routing is one of the funnest things you know, in PCB design, it, you can take a week to uh, lay your board out, but it could take you three months to route it unless you have the appropriate tools. And, the, you know, one of the things I think is key today is our designers are getting a little long in the tooth and we need to think about the tools that are available to us. We don't have to rely on the fact that I can figure out in a day how many, you know, I can get five traces in without a via here. No, that's not that's not the way to go about it anymore. The technology is way more advanced and our artwork, it's still artwork, you know, you can still be very creative, you can make a beautiful design, but take advantage of the tools that are available to you. Expedition has some incredible routing functionality and quite frankly, my good friends that are out there in design world, they don't want to go beyond what they they always have got the design done in the way they did it by laying one trace at a time and maybe a little push and shove here. But let's do groups. Let's do bulk routing in effective ways like taking advantage of sketch. And that's something you need to take a look at. When I think of automation, I think of my time when I used to work as a consultant. Speed and quality is everything. How fast can I get it done and bring the best quality to the table? And doing things manually doesn't cut it. But I'm not saying that uh, a manual is you just eliminate that. I just think you have to be interactive about it. And you're going to do a little manual, a little um, automation. And especially, it depends. Are you doing high speed? Are you doing high power? What are you doing? And, and designers today need to take advantage of when they can, what automation they can uh, within their, their tool set that, that they're using. And, and I find that a lot of designers stay within their comfort zone of success, even though their success may be that they're only 65% optimized or, or automated. They're leaving, you know, 35 to 40% on the table. One of the things that, that Ray was talking about is the super powerful, the, the sketch planner and the sketch router. But how many times have all of us routed a bunch of stuff and then we realized, oh man, we get that one net line, that one net line that wiggles between all those thinking things. And we're like, oh man, in, in the past, we used to have to rip all that up to get that one net line in again, right? And it never fails. It's something critical. It's always got to go in there. One of the things we've come up with is this hug router. As much as I love the sketch planner and the sketch router, the sketch planner added on to the sketch router just makes this incredible. But the hug router is for when you got to brute force that last net in. Let's face it, the sketch router and the planner, they're made to do what they do incredibly well, but they're meant to make it look like the artwork we create manually. They're not meant to violate DRCs. They're not meant to just get stuff in there. What they're meant for is to make it look like a human would do, but they give us the ability to do it, delete it, do it again until we get it the way we like it, right? The hug router is like that last inch is what I like to call it. Kind of like in the connector world, that last inch is what ruins the design, right? Well, the hug router lets us take that one net or two nets that didn't go in there and we'll select it and hit the hug route button. And what it does is it'll push and shove and squeak its way in there to make the connection. So it takes everything we just did in minutes with the sketch router and pushes it out of the way as it squeaks this last one in. And I love the fact that it'll it'll get that last net connected without us taking anything apart. There's nothing worse than having something group a section or a section or a group circuits routed or your board is percent routed and then they have a change, whether the change is they got to drop in an, another set of circuitry or they got to add a mounting hole that they, because of vibe testing, analysis, hey, we need another mounting hole. Now you got to push and shove parts and traces and copper and planes. And oh my gosh, automation allows us to do that more efficiently and more effectively. And then you manually doing that. Oh my God, it's just crazy. But you know what? I'll tell you what, we can go on and on about routing. Let, let's move on and let's talk about automation, when, especially when it comes to placement. Walk me through the examples uh, on how that would work when we talk about placement, placing parts. Because Ray, you mentioned a good placement will definitely ensure your success in routing. A bad placement, I don't care how good you route, a bad placement is just you're, you're setting out yourself up for failure, especially when it comes time to simulate your design. Give me a spill on that, Ray. Well, first of all, you know, the methodology of leveraging groups. So, you know, when you're an engineer and you're looking at parts and you want to keep them together, back in the day, of course, we just looked at the schematic and we just went ahead and picked one at a time and, oh, hey, that looks really good. But now today you can, 
you can leverage these properties. So, you're, you know, the front end design is smarter and it can hold information, as I mentioned earlier, how to push the back end. So, you know, again, shift to the left, move that control up in the design process. And so, you know, leveraging these groups with when you actually go into the layout, you can pull a whole group out and place it. And the tools have the ability now to, you know, not only place this block of data, you can keep it in this block and put multiple groups out into the layout phase or into the environment on the board. And the nice thing about these things is they're they're smart enough to know the area from a single side that they're going to require to be placed on the board. So you don't have to drop it all the way down to the to the component level. You can establish these blocks and then move them around and see the connectivity. Heavier lines means more connections. Lighter lines means less. And then you can actually go ahead and you know, these things have levels of hierarchy these days. So you can have groups within groups and you can have rules for each one of these groups where I could say this lower level group, which is all the passives, I don't even want those on the same side as my active devices. And I can set that up within this properties menu. And so when I place these groups, the actual devices go to the appropriate level. So maybe I've got a huge BGA with a bunch of decoupling and and, and terminating resistors, and they'll get smacked right onto the backside of the board with me without me even having to worry about it. So I think that's from a cool way of understanding the automation that you have available to you. And then there's also a lot of visual aids in today's environment. You can filter nets out. So let's say you don't care about power and ground so much right now. You've already done some things, but now you really want to look at priority nets. You can do a lot of great things. Everything within these tools now has a constraint class and a net class. Net classes being, you know, all about manufacturing, the physical aspect of this net. And then you have a constraint class that looks at topology of the nets and the timing of each net that has to run, if it's a differential pair and whatnot. And you can leverage these visual aids to see these things before you start getting too deep into routing and then have, oh, well, I've got this thing out of place. This needs to be somewhere else. So I think there's a great opportunity for us to take advantage of some visual aids that in the past were a lot harder. You know, maybe you had these basic highlight capabilities, but you still saw this rat's nest of hair that you could barely see. Today, you can mark these things and just see these individual groups of nets that are very critical to your design. What do you think, Gregory? Yeah, I love that you brought that up. The fact that you can filter on one end, let's say I've got a a component, a BGA, an ASIC, whatever, right? It's got a lot of nets coming off that thing. I can select just that component and say, only give me nets that, that come to or go from this component. And that's all the net lines I'll see. I won't see everything that's on both sides of the boards crossing through there, right? And the the cool thing about marking that is I can also select them. Let's say I'm working on an address bus for the FPGA. I can select just the address bus ones and mark them and only the address bus will show no matter what zoom level I go to. So if I zoom all the way out to the whole board, I'll still only see the address bus net lines. That's huge. Like Ray said, it can get to be like literally gray hair running through there, right? And we can't even see the components we're looking at because of all the net lines. This feature alone has really helped us. But one thing Ray touched on that I'm not sure anyone caught was the fact that when you place these groups and things, that can also carry all the way down to the planes that go with that. It doesn't have to be limited to just the traces and components. It also can include the plane layers and things like that that are going to be needed. Let's say a belly pad under a part for heat transfer, or you have something in the stack up that can be included. So that's huge to make sure that people know. Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, one of those things is that when you look at the component placement aspect, it's not just parts. I think that's what you're touching on there. That is a huge benefit within this tool. When you create groups in the expedition environment, you can also add mounting holes to that group. You can add seed vias. You can add planes. It can have almost any entity that you want. You just have to make sure it's a part of that group. And then it can be moved anywhere in the board, even off the board, so I can see what's going on. So great point, Gregory. And you just brought up another excellent point. This is why we banter back and forth so well, right? Not only is it things that are not necessarily component or trace related, like a mounting hole or things like this, right? But the key thing about that group is that every item in that group can be rotated and pushed to the top or bottom 
You know, you can manipulate all the items of that group individually or collectively. And that's huge because we don't always have the luxury of pushing that block into a new design and keeping it intact. It's got to morph into what we're doing with the new design. Now, some of that affects what we're doing overall. If we change the stack up and bust up the known good circuit, right? We had a great starting point, but now we're going to have to do a little more analysis. But the ability to do it is there. If we need to break it up and make it fit a new form factor, for example. You're so right. Uh, one of the things that I've found that's just huge, uh, if you have a sig- symmetrical stack up, today's designs are not through hole <laughs> in, in most cases. I've got blind and buried. I've got micro vias. And I all of a sudden, the guy told me that we need to move everything from the top to the bottom and everything from the bottom to the top. And this tool can do it in a heartbeat and rotate, mirror, you name it, you got it. And one of the things I just wanted to point out is this this tool has such depth that it gets overlooked at the functionality that can be there because you don't know what you don't know. And uh, I find that's, uh, you know, something that we uh, here at Siemens want to help our customers understand what they don't know. They have so much functionality that they, uh, you know, at times they're focused on doing the design. They can't keep up with what's available. And that's our job. And that's why you know, I, I love my job doing that in, in educating. Exactly. So we, we talked about placement. We talked about routing. We talked about the shift left, you know, getting the constraints up um, in the front end, especially when it comes to what the double A's can do at the very beginning. And one of the things that, that, you know, I'll mention is that today, you know, we have to be designed for resilience, which means that we need that, uh, that supply chain intelligence up front, you know, and, and um, you know, I had a long conversation with Richard Barnett from Supply Frame and having that intelligence is key nowadays because you've got to make smart decisions up front. So when that double E is placing his or picking his part, he knows that that part's going to be available by the time they get ready to go to fabrication and assembly. And um, that's key, you know, that part of that shift left. But, you know, I want to move on. I want, I want to talk about what do we see uh, when it comes to roadblocks that are implementing the, these kind of best practices that we talked about? Well, a lot of times the typical roadblocks that you're going to find is what we like to call the I don't know what I don't know feature. Uh, exactly. When we try to move forward with design automation, PCB designers don't know what that looks like. And quite frankly, as a PCB designer, we're not used to using automation. We were hired to do this stuff. And so a lot of it is a little bit of unfamiliarity and maybe a little a feeling like I lose a little bit of control. I don't have the ability to be the ninja if I'm using all this automation. And, and people need to look at it a little bit differently than that. It, it needs to be looked at as another tool in Batman's belt rather than saying Batman has no powers, right? It's, he's not just a rich dude. He's a rich dude that knows how to get the tool to get the job done. Yeah, <laughs> so, I want that exactly. car. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Any number of the cars, <laughs> right? But And then the current ecosystem plays a little bit of part in this too to prevent the use of automation. So hopefully that was along the lines of what you were thinking. Anything you want to throw at, Ray? I think most organizations understand the need to um, update the overall process from a development perspective, but they don't always have an idea of where to start. We have assisted in process by doing many process assessments. You know, you can get your vendor, you can get Siemens to come in, look at your process, understand where you might be able to improve. And and believe me, I've done this a number of times. There's always areas for improvement. Either you have, and companies have access to tools that can help them be more productive, to drive quality, drive time to market faster, and they don't know that they have them. And it's not because there's one guy who holds the key to a lot of this stuff, but it doesn't. they don't disseminate that information down through the structure. Uh, but there's many ways to improve the best practices and to implement these new tools and do it in a conservative manner, right? So it doesn't affect the overall design process, you know, you don't hurt the time that it's taking. It actually may initially take you a few more days, but the benefit that you get out of it is going to be tenfold. I always bring it up coming from the mill arrow because I've seen it more, more prevalent than the mill arrow is that you have the legacy processes that they've been doing for the decades and multiple decades. And um, that process, it needs to be updated with, especially with today's automation and today's tools that are available. And they still have the manual spreadsheets that they're doing. They still have, like you mentioned, Ray, you know, you have one guru who, who you no, know, only he does this. You got to give it to him. But what happens when he goes on vacation or, or even worse, what happens when, when that gentleman retires and 
But let's face it, most designers today are in their mid to late 50s or early 60s, and the newer generation is not there yet. And we just don't have that, that wave of new uh, print circuit layout engineers that, that, uh, who are skilled at laying out boards. And instead, you've got double E's coming out of school being forced into layout who've never touched the layout before, but that's what they're being tasked with. And the process, ha- having an updated process, I always say that in general, most companies are about maybe 75% optimized. They're leaving 25% on the table uh, of optimization that they could be taking advantage of within their process. I mean, the last time I, I was at PCB West and I did my uh, best practice uh, presentation, uh, industry best practices for PCB design, the majority of people raised their hand when I asked, how many of you have not optimized your process in the last five years? All the class raised their hand. They hadn't assessed themselves, you know, in, in two to five years in, in doing so. I think uh, that that's a big problem. And, and they're still doing, hey, this is what we didn't have any success with and we're going to stick with it. Well, that success is really only like 75% at best. And that's at best. Yeah, I, I think everyone is so focused on getting the product out the door that they don't take a step back and look at how effective their process really is. And in the end, how much better that process could be and drive that time to market num- time frame down so drastically. And they're just too focused on getting it out. You were talking earlier, we've identified a lot of these problems and things that can go wrong. One of the things I like to tell people that we can do to solve that problem is education really is the best medicine in this case for solving the issue of what you don't know or you don't know where to go. And unfortunately, in this case of automation, what you don't know really can hurt you in your schedule. You know, a lot of people like to say what you don't know can't hurt you. Well, in this case, it can. So the good news is people like Ray and myself, we offer training sessions, either whether they're on demand training, you can go online and consume all you want. Or we have webinars all the time that are put on by our experts in the customer support division. Or even Ray and I do on-site visits to solve these issues. I'll give you my last take on this one, I think, is that the biggest roadblock that I think most companies see is, is company culture or internal culture. They just don't buy into it. They stick to their old ways because their old ways have been successful. You know, they've been able to have success. But when you, you gauge that success to what the potential success they could have, I always feel they're leaving money on the table. That's what I say, company culture. And I talk a lot about that. And I think you guys have witnessed that with me through my decades of utilizing you guys' support and the different customers or different projects that I've been on. You've seen that environment and you've witnessed it firsthand. We have a really unique situation here, Steph, and you got to experience this, right? You talk about corporate culture. It's not always just the culture. It could be the corporate environment. Things are locked down so tightly that we don't have permissions to do certain things, right? And as as the employee or the engineer in that company, you don't always have the driving force you need to make change happen. And this is why I say it's so critical that you engage with people like Ray and myself, your local support folks, because we do have the ability to go interface with management. And let them know what these roadblocks are and help them engage in putting that to an initiative that the corporation wants to take on now to make a change so that people can get their job done with these best practices. You're saving time and saving money. In the end, at the upper leadership level, money talks. And that can be huge because as an engineer, you may not have the access to those upper level management folks. But Ray and I meet with them all the time. That's awesome. Awesome. We can go on and on and on. So I, I'll just, we got to be at least 30 <laughs> plus minutes into this. So I, I thought we were on for two hours today. Thank you oh, very no, much. No, no, I wish. Yeah. I wish. That, that's for next time. That's for next all time. Right. That's for part two. So oh, this is great. Thank you for the invite. No, all, all right. You know, I, I think we've outlined the best practices or at least, you know, you know, a, a, a the core of the best practices when it comes to design automation. I, Gregory, Ray, I mean, I can't thank you enough for your invaluable insight. You know, again, you guys are awesome. Keep, keep doing what you do because- you have guys like me who, before I came to Siemens, you helped me be successful by setting me up for success with what you do. And well, I think I can say this for uh, Greg too, man. I mean, we get a lot out of helping our customers. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's the highlight of our day, believe it or not. The harder the problem is, the more satisfaction we get out of kicking its butt. Yeah. You bet. Cool. All right. Well, thanks again. I want to thank everyone for tuning in and definitely tune in uh, to our next episode where we talk about concurrent design. Mm-hmm.